Hi, everyone. Can't believe we are already on our second episode of Mel and Takriya with us podcast. If you have been following us since episode one, thank you so much for your devotion. And if it's your first time with us, welcome. On Mikuk, we discuss and discover the meaning behind Korean and public holidays in Korea. So I have been working really hard on practicing and preparing contents with our guests for our viewers. So I hope all of you guys enjoy as well. For today's theme, it is all about the symbol of peace and victory. So the holidays we will be discussing about today are the independence movement and the National Liberation Day in Korea. So let's not keep our guest waiting. I want to introduce them right away. For those who watch Korean broadcasts or radio, you might be familiar with them. So he's born in Russia and he came to Korea in 2003. And now an established representative of foreigners living in Korea, I want to welcome Ilya Belikov. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. I- I just can't believe you're here. When I first saw you coming in, I was like a little star stunned. I was like, oh, I only saw him on TV (laughs) and now he's in front of me. Uh, Basically, um, I actually saw your show back then when it was first broadcast, the show with other foreigners and like discussing and debating, you know, things ranging from like day to day lives to like culture and then international relations and history and stuff like that. from that point, I had followed for like a few years, actually, like almost really religiously, like watching it and from America, too. So like each time it came out with upset. So that's how I actually learned a little bit more Korean. Wow. <laughs> Some of the topics are really difficult, actually, to follow. So um, and, and, and the just kind of like the atmosphere with the other guests and stuff. You guys seem so close and like good environment. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank so, you. <laughs> so for, for those that like are maybe not familiar, I doubt anyone out there doesn't know Ilya. <laughs> but can you just give us like a brief introduction of yourself to the, our viewers, please? Sure, absolutely. Um, hi, guys. My name is Ilya and uh, I'm originally from Russia, but I have been living in South Korea for almost 18 years right now. That's a that's crazy long time. I would never have guessed. It's a crazy long He's time. He's a it's... young looking guy. And <laughs> at first, when we first in, like got to know each other, I was like, oh, eight years. Okay, eight years is pretty long time. He's like, no, 18 years. I was like, 18 years? Is that real? I thought maybe we're, well, come on, we look like the similar age. So I was like, oh, no, no. thank you. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> so um, basically, I have been living in Korea for the half of my life. So, and uh, I'm officially a Korean national from 2016. So, yes. And uh, (laughs) we touched a little bit, but I I think people are a little curious about your background, your story. Um, Just a little bit about me, too. And it's kind of a little bit similar. I studied some Korean in university in the U.S. And then eventually led me to working a little bit in Korean language in the U.S., but eventually coming to Korea to study Korean. So your story about a venture into Korea the past 18 years or before 18 years in Russia, you know, how did it come about? Um, it was uh, not that fascinating, though. I think it's fascinating, though, <laughs> because it's it's a journey, right? Everyone's journey is different. It's different. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Uh, well, I was learning Korean back in Russian university. That was my major at the university. Do, do you mind if I ask, like, sure. why, why not a different language and why Korean instead? It was really, really, really situational and occasional. I didn't mean to go to really? Korean department. So it's kind of like fate, kind of? Like um, it just I guess so. Way? I guess wow. you can call it okay. that. Um, I always wanted to learn foreign languages because I like to learn foreign languages. I learned English when I was in high school and I just liked everything about, like, different cultures and languages and stuff. So um, I wanted to go to the English department. I failed. No way. You failing? I, failed. I don't think anyone can believe that. I did fail it. And um, so I, we, me and my parents, we were looking for the ways to uh, uh, find another department. And uh, since I was living in Vladivostok and we are geographically very close to all those countries like China, Japan and South Korea, my dad was like, hey, you can go to one of those countries. So we applied to all of them. 
and uh, I got admitted into Korean department, which was not popular at all around that <laughs> so time. Like whole, no one knew maybe about only, like maybe only one or two applicants. Uh, a year there was uh, they had like ten, like nine or ten seats in the oh. department. They accepted uh, nine or ten students that year, okay. and at the time I was applying, there was like three or four people applied. Okay, that's <laughs> so half half the seats were were able yeah. to be filled. Oh wow! So, but thank you, Dad. Right, Dad was the one that kind know, of recommended right? it. I know, I know. And look at me, eighteen years later, here yeah. and, here and talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I I think you mentioned a little bit about you know our podcast series is supported by KF Korea Foundation, right. and they were actually maybe supportive to you i actually have yeah a long connection to this organization because uh, the korea foundation was the organization that provided me with this scholarship and uh, on that scholarship i first came here to korea and uh, i had a lot to study at the uh, korean language institute here at yonsei university Amazing. for one year yeah um uh, years later, uh, when I was into broadcasting after 2015, they approached our program again. Mm. And me and another guy from Pijun Sangvidam from Abnormal yeah. Summit, Tyler, yeah. uh, a <laughs> guy from the States, we became the honorary ambassadors for the Korean wow. Foundation. And right. uh, that's what I'm doing now. So, yeah, 18 years with KF. Like, KF, <laughs> they better be supporting us and you at the same time, right? <laughs> Anyways, um, actually listening to your story and, you know, how before you came to Korea and Russia, discovering that interest and that faith that kind of brought you here, along with being here for so many years and your presence um, in the foreign community, I wanted to just let you know, one of the reasons why we reached out to you is... Uh, letting foreigners know more about the culture and history we thought you'd be a perfect role with us to kind of let people know about this topic and also kind of learning with the viewers too this is um not something that we usually talk about on a normal basis so this kind of gives us the opportunity to really dig a little bit deeper even if it's just the surface you know not everyone has the time to really dive in deep and yeah history and that's kind of boring sometimes you know so we just want to let people know you know these are public holidays they're on the calendar and that's it. They, that's all they really kind of care about. It's it's just there and, you know, there's a bigger meaning behind it. So moving on, actually, um, as we discuss today's subject, I think it would be great to just keep the theme of peace and victory throughout the episode. And uh, basically to start off, let's do Independence Movement Day. Uh, it's celebrated on March 1st and also National Liberation Day celebrated on August 15th. So uh, coincidentally, we are filming this just a few days after, after the Liberation exactly. Day. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Liberation Day. And, um, you know, just like any holidays and maybe other countries, we had uh, the day off. So I was one of the lucky ones that had a three day weekend. Uh, were you able to rest a little bit or um, you were working? I was working because I'm a freelancer. I'm not okay. doing my nine to six, nine to five kind of stuff. So I'm a freelancer. That means I'm working all day, Sundays, oh. Saturdays, holidays. Oh. That's tough, but you get to choose your own times maybe. Exactly. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. good. You that have means some... that I have some time out during the regular week. Right. A little bit more freedom to fit your own schedule. That's great. Actually, um, to touch base on these kind of days on the calendar, I have also friends that are freelancers or they're not just like a regular employee set person. So they forget sometimes, actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. normal. And and I was like, oh, by the way, you know, I'm free on Monday because uh, it's a red day. And they're like, oh, it's a red day. I'm yeah. like, wow. <laughs> Korean? <laughs> it's a red day. You exactly, didn't know. Yeah. But obviously, if you don't have like a set uh business company kind of thing it doesn't really matter right it they doesn't, just yeah unless it's on the calendar so especially if you are in the broadcasting mm. and doing like radio and tv like i am there are no rec actually holidays like <gasps> you feel they work on you do like, especially if you if you're doing the radio and i'm doing radio and it's like it needs to be like every monday as my radio for example like we are on air every monday it doesn't matter if it's chuseok or solal or a regular yeah, monday chuseok and solal are really big holidays and I you're know, still working but radio still needs to go air oh, i see that i learned something today i didn't know broadcasting was so tough all right um actually i wanted to get into some technical history and facts about um, 
starting with Independence Movement Day. So everyone probably... <laughs> Even before we yeah, yeah. start, um, I would Go like ahead. to point out because... These are like these two days we are talking about today are actually being quite messed up by the foreigners because they are pretty much about the same. Everyone, is it like Korea Independence Day? Okay, that's very true. Because <laughs> like people don't really distinguish between the uh, uh, March 1st movement right. and August 15th, the Liberation Day. They're like, is it the same? Like it, it, it has to do something with Japan, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, so we need to differentiate those to like distinguish those to. August 15 is the Liberation Day. It started on 1945 when Japan surrendered during the uh, World War II, right? It, uh, uh, American allies on the south and Soviet allies on the north, they freed the Korean Peninsula, which ultimately led to the uh, construction of two countries. That was on August 15. March 1st was the solely Korean Independence Movement Day. That was the day then Koreans started to realize that they don't want to live under the Japanese rule and they want to have their own independent country. And they started the movement. And that movement started on March 1st of 1919. And that's what we are celebrating March 1st. So these are totally different uh, days, totally different historical events. I mean, the uh, events of 1919 eventually led to the liberation but they doesn't really coincide. Exactly, like. which is completely different and celebrated yeah. on very different meanings, right? Exactly, yeah. But I I will guiltily admit to that I was like, okay, Movement Day, Independence Day. Yeah. Those, those words by itself are very exactly, yeah. similar, but then obviously two different time periods, two different people that sacrificed their lives right. for these days. Right, right, right. Um, I think that's a really great point that you had mentioned, and I'm guilty of it of the same. So basically, these two holidays are completely different holidays, as you had mentioned. And a lot of them are still, or now, hopefully after this podcast, they know the differences. Uh, and continuing on, uh, Eli, you are from Russia, so I wanted to ask, you know, in relation to these holidays and Korea and Russia has a very deep history between uh, you know, coming about it until currently now. So can you give us a little bit more detail on, you know, Russia and Korea's history in regards to these holidays? Uh, well, absolutely. Like, to understand what happened, you need to have the uh, historical background right. around that. So what happened in 1910, Japan, Japan colonized uh, a Korean peninsula, right? So it was, fact, uh, speak, like, factually speaking, it was a Japan here in this territory. So in 1919, a lot of uh, independence fighters, they said, no, we want our country back. So they started this fight movement, a movement against Japanese colonialism. But since Japan was here, and of course, Japanese didn't approve of those movements and didn't want people to fight for their freedom, they started to push those people out. Mm -hmm. And their routes for those people to go outside of Korean Peninsula was actually just uh, limited down to two. One, a lot of people went to Shanghai, to China. Another one, they went to Vladivostok, Russia. And the reason they went to Vladivostok, for one thing, it was geographically very close. Uh, at that time, we didn't have the peninsula divided into south and north. It was just one country. So we actually had a border with that imperial Russia. And around that time, it was uh, 20s last century. So a lot around that time, Koreans had a very favorable view, very favorable image of Russia, because Russia was always Russia had just had a fight with Japan over Korean Peninsula. While it's lost, still it had an image of you know of a fighter for Korean Peninsula for Korean people. So Korean people and Korean independence fighters gladly flew to Vladivostok, where they uh, continued with their um, you know, movement, their life, their, life, their planning. Right. Uh, one of the most famous independence fighters and movement uh, uh, activists was uh, An Jung Gun, and all Koreans know him. Uh, he actually has uh, a museum in Vladivostok dedicated oh, wow. to oh, him. Oh, wow. Honoring him. Because um, he was staying there, he was like planning all whatever he was planning for, he was planning all these deeds there. We have a museum there. We have a lot of other people who were staying in Vladivostok and um, uh, then they moved like farther north or farther to the west of Russia. And 
even asking the uh, then Russian emperor for help. So um, if you look at that historical perspective, this is a huge, huge connection between Russia and Korean in that. And I think, as you had said, because of the location of that uh, area and what is now North Korea, but then back then was just whole of Korea, you know, being controlled and colonized by the Japanese was something that they couldn't really withstand anymore and fighting for their freedom and going to Russia with the support. And they had a very good feeling about Russia and, and they wanted to go there. So and even now, uh, there are uh, ethnic Koreans living in Russia and originally from what is now North Korea, but basically right. Korea. Absolutely. So uh, right now we have a lot of people who flew from North, which is now North Korea. Back then it was just one country. Uh, they originally flew to the uh, uh, region which is now Vladivostok, but mm -hmm. later than in 30s, Stalin moved, forcefully moved them to the Central Asian countries, mm -hmm. which are now places like Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan. So that's why we see a lot of ethnic Koreans living in those areas. Uzbekistan has actually the biggest Korean diaspora outside of North Korea. I heard something about that, but I'm, yeah. I'm actually surprised to confirm that with you too. Yeah, a lot of Korean, ethnic Koreans. The place with a lot of ethnic Koreans in Russia is a Sahalin island, but it has a totally different... That's, is that in Kazakhstan or that's... Uh, that's, that's very close to Vladivostok. Well, okay. relatively close to Vladivostok, just like one day by train, maybe. <laughs> okay. That's considered very close in Russia. I'm confused one day, <laughs> traveling one day. Is but um, it's an East Sea, it's a huge island, and it used to belong to Japan. And since Japan wanted to develop it, and it uh, needed people to be used in the mines, uh, they went into Korea, they went into Pusan, they took Koreans who were living in Pusan and placed them on Sahalin Island. So right now, almost 99% of all ethnic Russian Koreans who are living in Sahalin Island are ethnically from Gyeongsang area, yeah. from Busan area. It's interesting to know that that the background of those people, well, we talked about, you know, the north of Korea and Russia where they are, and those are the ethnic Koreans from that area, but then Busan, all the way all the from way the down, south yeah. of Korea, going, you can see those ethnic um, native Koreans, their background all the way in a different country. So, you know, hearing about the history of how Korean native ethnic Koreans are moving around during that time period and how much Russia had supported and so forth really shape its history and even now to really good relation with with Russia and Korea so I'm glad for yeah so a lot of uh, guys a lot of very famous independence fighters like An jung -gun or Choi jae hyung or uh, the guy that uh, has been expatriated back um, into Korea just a couple of days ago, Hongbom Do, they were fighting for the independence of their country. They were not the mainstream because the mainstream and the government, the temporary government was located in Shanghai in China. So they were supporting Kim Gu with all the he wanted to do, but still they played a very important role in that. These are very important reasons on why this day was important and how it played into Korea's history. So for more technical background, since 1910, many people have resented the colonization of Korea following the imperialism of the Japanese empire. Before the movement, people longed for independence and developed many independence movements accordingly. However, it wasn't until the March 1st independence movement that caused national resentment because it could not endure the harsh colonial rule anymore. So I wanna talk about a little bit on the global stance. You know, we did talk about Russia and China a little bit, Kazakhstan, you know, uh, ethnic Koreans who kind of fled to fight for the independence. Uh, you know, there are global powers all watching this kind of movement as well. And for the U.S. in our part, you know, it was it was hard because we had we had supported you know South Korea and then so watching that movement there's a quote here that we have uh, since U.S. President Wilder Rosen insisted on national self determination and said he would respect each country's right to self determination so Korea also thought that independence would be possible according to this global trend however this self to self However, to self-determination was only for colonies of defeated countries in World War I. And Korea, a Japanese colony that was 
victoriously a country that was not like this. I think we had covered a lot of history and deep understanding of the this movement and this day. Uh, actually, moving on to the next portion of this historical kind of movement, let's talk about and start with National Liberation Day. Uh, can you give us a little brief on National Liberation Day, please, Ilya? Well, well, basically, what we need to know about the National Liberation Day is it's on August 15th, and that's exactly the day when uh, Japan surrendered in World War II, and uh, the Korean Peninsula has been liberated. Um, around that time, it was not divided yet. Uh, it was one country. Uh, on August 15th, Japan... Uh, like reclaimed, like, like it started to, uh, it, uh, it cancelled all the territories it used to have before the colonization. It let go of Korean Peninsula, that let go of other islands it had in Pacific, including Taiwan, including the Philippines, and all the other places. So that became the uh, National Liberation Day and the day when the Korean Peninsula became the one country again. It wouldn't last long, right. unfortunately. But uh, on 1945, uh, uh, August 15, Korea became one country again. And actually, it's interesting to learn because um, everyone knows currently, right, there's a North and a South Korea. And they, a lot of people don't really know why or behind the scenes on what happened. And including this day, it's very significant because, you know, once it was liberated from Japanese and then shortly it was together, uh, you know, it it kind of splits in the two. So this day has a uh, beautiful meaning, you know, uh, relief from the Japan colonization, but then in result as well, you know, it, it, it's still ongoing, North and South Korea, it's ceasefire right now. So this, this holiday has a lot of history between what it is currently now. The uh, very naming of this holiday in Korean language, because usually we call it a Kwangbokchol, and if you look at the Chinese characters that are stand behind this name, it means uh, getting back the light. Mm, so, cool. yes, yeah, so they are, they are getting back their independence, they are getting back their sovereignty. Uh, so it's became the country again. It's not a colony anymore. It's very meaningful. Kwangbo. Yeah, Kwangbo. Yeah. So again, um, this day was actually not just a few days ago. Yeah, yeah and yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard to kind of celebrate this kind of day with Corona going on. You can't really gather very much, um, but it is a day that uh, people have, you know, they think about history again, instead of just, you know, a day off, like I was saying in the beginning of the podcast, it's good to reflect, right, on what Korea is now because of that day. And, you know, if it wasn't because of that day, we don't really know, <laughs> you know, it, it's possible it could be ruled by another country still. So it's very good to deep a little digger on the history of that. The Independence Movement Day, March 1st, was an opportunity to inform the world of Korea's will for independence and indirectly influence the liberation of Korea. Using this podcast, I hope we can also reflect on the meaning of March 1st and Liberation Day. Well, we probably need to uh, remind our listeners and viewers that um, the Korean Liberation Day actually was just the beginning of what happened That's right. first. Uh, I mean, it, it is a major milestone in Korean history of 20th century, and it's a very important milestone too. But uh, that's actually, honestly speaking, the day when everything started. And the situation that we are aware of now has started exactly on that day. Uh, we know that uh, on, during the Liberation Day, during the days of August in uh, 1945, two armies were liberating the Korean Peninsula, right? It was American troops on the south yeah. and Allies troops on the south and uh, Soviet troops on the north. So they divided Korean Peninsula approximately in the middle on 38th parallel. Uh, originally, neither Americans nor Soviets wanted to establish a state on their respective uh, territories. They wanted to just liberate South Korea from the Japanese troops and that leave it to Koreans to, you know, to continue with their lives. 
And that what both actually did uh, from uh, from Soviet part. Uh, there was a guy uh, who was actually born in Russia and uh, huh? was uh, uh, in Soviet troop. And his name is okay. Kim Yura in Russian or Kim Il-sung in Korean. Uh, so he had uh, the Korean troops to move into Pyongyang and to establish a country oh, there. Okay. And uh, from the uh, south part, uh, since Americans didn't want to stay in Korea, they wanted to go back to their country. They didn't want to operate here. They didn't want to control this. They found another guy who was speaking very good English and who was studying in the States before. And his name was Lee Sing Man. And they were like, okay, you lead the, your people. So we basically had the two guys starting the respective countries. At that time, it wasn't statehood. It was more like an organization's uh, being hidden here and there. But um, three years from 45 to 48, we had this, well, basically chaos on Korean Peninsula mm -hmm. because we had the American-controlled South and Soviet-controlled North. And since it was, you need to think about this in retrospective. It was 1945. It was just after the World War II. The uh, mm -hmm. Soviet Union... Uh, won the uh, Germany Nazis, the Allied forces, mm -hmm. along with American troops, won the Pacific War with Japan. So uh, it was the very essence, the very time of the stand between the communism bloc and the capitalistic bloc. Mm -hmm. And uh, around that time, there, uh, there was a lot of talk about whether either of those countries will lean to either side either to capitalistic or communistic. And since Kim Il-sung was the Soviet born, he supported that kind of system, he supported that kind of uh, um, values. He wanted to create the country that uh, took best from Soviet system and implemented on Korean peninsula, on Korean territory. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he started. So he proclaimed the uh, very first constitution on Korean peninsula back in 1948, thus creating the... Uh, uh, Korean National Democratic, whatever yeah. state, whatever yeah, it's called, we call this country yeah. North Korea right now. Right. And because of that, South Koreans proclaimed their own country, which became the Republic of Korea or South Korea as we know it. And then lasted for two more years. After that, the North Korean decided that no, it's not going to work. We're going to need to unify it and we're going to use the violence to unify the Korean Peninsula. Mm. So we have our uh, uh, Korean War broke uh, on the peninsula in 1950 and that's how it was developed i would say that those five years from 45 to 50 uh, mm -hmm. were probably the most chaotic and the most uh with no uh like it was literally the chaotic five years of no one knowing what's happening it was uh, a fight for a power, both South and North. It was fight of two systems, communistic and capitalistic. Uh, it only ended in uh, 1953 after the armistice between North Korea and South Korea. Well, not exactly between those countries, but between so Soviet Union and uh, the United States. America, yeah. So, and still we have these stand, we still have these two countries divided on one peninsula. Yeah. And here we are in 2021, uh, 70, what, like 75, 73, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. years yeah, later, yeah, we still so have years. Uh, the peninsula divided into two countries, into two blocks, into two systems. And when, and when you had mentioned that period of liberation and the Korean War, the chaotic uh, years of those, you know, it's great that they were liberated from Japanese, but then it was just other powers coming in. And actually, probably at that time, the people suffered, the citizens suffered the most because they, there was no control. You know, people were so, you know, happy that they were free, but then, you know, they, they were looking around. They didn't know where they were going. They did, they couldn't, they were trying to govern their own, but other powers are kind of controlling in that in that side. It, it really was maybe one of the darkest moments Probably, for Korea. Probably, because if you think about it, Korea hasn't been independent for the most part of 20th century. It was under the Japanese rule from the very beginning of 20th century. 
they didn't have enough experience and they didn't have enough people to know how to govern the country. So at the moment they got their independence, they were... They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do with it, literally, yeah. need some support. And uh, international background back then, it was literally the heist of the uh, stand between Soviet Union and the United States. So these two great powers... Superpowers. Superpowers, they came into this, they made the Korean Peninsula the uh, place for fight between mm. two, two uh, right. systems, this, this, right? Yeah. yeah, this battleground. This or battleground. Say, it yeah. is a battleground, yeah. basically. So at that time, Korea and Korean statehood itself was so weak, it uh, had no other way but to fall to exactly. either and that's of the how sides. You had said we are here today yeah. with two Koreas. Unfortunately, but, you know, we are hoping one day Absolutely. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, I mean, we only, we we do have a lot of history from other countries that were separated. We have Germany, we have Vietnam, we have a lot of countries like that. And all those countries finally unified together in one. I mean, uh, my personal opinion, it would be really hard for Korea to be unified again. Right. It probably will take some time. The history is so kind of so deep into yeah. into it and poli- not only just political but the people it's been years you know the just decades is just too great i would say the economic mm. division it's very politi- difficult political division uh there are too many countries and it's uh, not just the matter of two koreas a lot of other countries are mingled in this one we have china we have japan we have america we have united states we have russia so and all of those countries have their own interests on Korean Peninsula. Exactly. It's not going to be really, really easy. Uh, but eventually, I do think that Korea will unify. It will take some time. <laughs> yeah. It will. But eventually, in some decades, couple of decades, century maybe. But And you'll still be here. We'll be able to witness it. I hope so. I definitely hope so. Yeah. Actually, it was really interesting to start with, you know, just something we see on the calendar, like public holidays to the history. And then actually a little bit on the diplomatic and political side of it is really important that it wraps up together. So uh, I want to say, you know, even though it's difficult to talk about, it's something that we have to say and, and people to educate themselves and learn. And I just really want to thank you, Ilya, for coming out here, you know, bright and <laughs> early this morning and bringing up the energy for me too <laughs> to kind of get through this podcast. But it was really enlightening. So thank you for your time to coming here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was a nice, really nice pleasure to talk to you about these topics. And I love history. As you can <laughs> probably see, you're right. <laughs> I think I'm getting the influence from you. I think I need to do some study and, and some history now. It's actually quite in- interesting, especially with someone to kind of talk back and forth to. You know, doing a self-study is, is kind of boring. It's because so. of boring, yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting when you actually have a person who can right. talk about that. Yeah. yeah, and for me personally, it's not every day, this kind of thing. So it, it's a really good opportunity for, for me. So... Uh, Again, you know, we're lucky to have Ilya here today. And for our future podcasts, we have a wide range of guests at Mikook Podcast. So in the future, I hope our team has a chance of working with you again, hopefully. (laughs) And uh, I just want to, um, we concluded our show with some very interesting discussions to Korean public holidays with Ilya as our special guest. So until next time, we will discuss more topics regarding Korea's history and dissect how it is current in modern times. So stay tuned next week on the Miku podcast. See you guys soon. Bye.